Hey, I'm Stephanie Rublitz. Welcome to my channel. Last week I set myself a challenge to completely go through and de-stash my entire fabric stash, just like clear it out of things I don't use anymore. And instead I made two Met Gala dresses for my kids and had a red carpet event on my front porch. I regret nothing. All right, so I have a couple things going on here today. Uh, I was last night like mentally like kind of preparing like for for shooting this video about de-stashing my stash and as I was scrolling through my YouTube feed, as you do, I came across a uh, Kittenish Behaviors video for Show Us Your Stash 2020. So it's it's a collaboration between Kittenish Behavior and A Pocket or Two. I will link their channels down below if you don't know them. Um, and so yeah, they're, they want to be able to like see everybody's stash and they can't go to people's houses to pick through their fabric. So <laughs> they've started this. It's on Instagram and uh, YouTube. I, I suppose even if you're a blogger, you could do it and use the hashtags. So they just want everybody to participate who wants to. First off though, let's talk a little bit about the D stash because I had some questions um, last week when I mentioned that I had a history in performance and costuming. Which is one of the reasons why I wanted to go through my stash and get rid of a bunch of stuff because my costuming is history. <laughs> and so yeah, I went to theater school here in Calgary. I went to Mount Royal University and right out of university I was doing, I mean I had like high school and other performance community theater past even before that. But often when you write at a theater school, if you want to work, you have to create the work yourself, which often means you are writing performing, directing, producing, costuming, doing all the things. It's it's just, it's the life. It is. And it was really fun. Uh, there was one show I remember doing where uh, some friends and I got together and we put on a show and I, in the span of three weeks, sewed 28 original pieces, most of which I self-drafted. And now I look back on that and I'm like, I don't have the time for that anymore. You know, now that I have kids, um, the only theatrical work that I do is for the past 13 years, I've been directing a forum theater program for youth in at-risk communities. And it's, it's a passion project for me. I really believe in arts for social change and I'm really happy doing that work. And even once my kids get a little older and I'm not needed at home as much, I'll probably still tread those boards again, but I don't think I will ever go back to that life of being all the things like being, a uh, a theater company in and, in and of myself and having to do all that costuming and stuff. So in cleaning out my stash, I had to be careful though because I do still have to sew like Halloween costumes and the last couple of years my stash has been invaluable for sewing Halloween costumes for my kids. So I just sort of keep that in mind. So I did keep some fabrics that I had like a decent quantity of that I knew that I could, you know, it was going to be versatile because of the amount that I had, but there was still so much stuff. There was even in my notions, sequin appliques, lace, just stuff that I'm, I'm probably not going to use. And uh, there is that like little sewing hoarder tendency to like, no, I need to keep all of this because I, I've taken so long to curate this like collection of amazing stuff. But also that makes me sad because this fabric could be getting used for something really beautiful and, and it's not. So I got rid of a lot. And I have to say that whole like Marie Kondo, like uh, Kanamari method did not work for me at all because all of my fabric brought me joy. <laughs> so holding it and be like, does this bring me joy? Yes, yes, it all brought me joy. And so I had to do like less Maria Kondo, more like Stephen King. <laughs> and sometimes you have to kill your darlings. And that's what I did. So what I do have to show you today in the Show Us Your Stash 2020 is all stuff that made the cut that I have kept and I'm happy to show you guys what that is. All right, question number one, your favorite fabric. Um, you know that scene in Ever After? It's a really old movie that Drew Barrymore did and she was like dating the prince and he was like, what's your favorite book? And she's like, oh, I could no sooner pick a favorite star in the heavens. That's what this question feels like a little bit to me. Um, so what I'm really excited to sew with right now is this. It's um, bamboo cotton stretch fleece, and I'm gonna make a hoodie out of it. For me, because I'm so tall, I'm, I'm over six feet tall, and so um, to get hoodies that are long enough for me, I usually have to get men's hoodies, and to get 
hoodies that accommodate my bust because I'm buying men's hoodies means I have to buy them really oversized and so I just look really bulky and boxy in them which I mean sometimes I don't care but it'll be nice to have a hoodie that is like fitted to my long curvy body so I am super excited for that but the fabric that just like brings me joy and this is one of the ones the costuming fabrics that I kept I don't know if this is going to it is, I mean, it's polyester, but it's supposed to look like a silk brocade. And I used to do a ton of corsets. Uh, and I love sewing corsets. It's kind of like the meeting of sewing and building. And I just, I, I love the structure. I, I just, I just love them. I love them. I just don't need to sew anymore. I've got probably a dozen in my basement. <laughs> but this fabric, when I see it, it makes me think of corseting projects and I've kept this because there's a good amount of it and I can maybe work it into a Halloween costume or something for my kids. Question two, oldest fabric. Okay, so I have this, these two, which are in a set and there was actually a third fabric that went with it. And it was one of those, we've all been there. It's like the day of the office Christmas party and nothing to wear, so quick, better sew something. So I sewed, I'll see if I can find a picture of it around, but it'd be like before before smartphone times, so I'd actually have to look at a photo album. But um, yeah, so I made just a straight cut skirt with slits up it um, so that I could utilize like a really nice gold trim. I don't, you can sort of see, it was, it was a different, um, it was a thicker trim, but it had um, a finished edge with some gold on it. And so I got this fabric from a friend of mine, Pert Paul, who I worked with right out of high school in KFC. Uh, and she was moving and she did a lot of sewing. She was from India and so she would make um, traditional outfits and she had all of these like sets of fabric. So you would have like one fabric for your pants, one fabric for your shirt and one fabric for your scarf. Um, and so that's what she gave me. And I just haven't found the right project for these yet, but they will get used eventually. That's why I kept them. Question three, something that I'm scared to cut into. Nothing. I. I Fabric's fabric is there to be used. I just, I, I don't have anything that's that precious. Um, I, I have experienced that in the past and I think just as I'm getting older, I'm like, dang, life's too short for that. Like just cut into that fabric, eat that piece of cake. You just do what you need to do to be, be happy. And yeah, I don't, I don't have anything that I would not, that I'm scared to cut into. Just doesn't, doesn't exist in my life. Sorry, boring. The stuff that I don't know what to do with it. So a couple years ago, my sister went to Tanzania and she brought me back some really pretty textiles. So there's this one. And this one. And this one. So with this one and this one, I had kind of thought, especially this one, I think would be like really nice um, flowy palazzo pants, but there's not enough of either of them. And I don't do, okay, today plaid is maybe the exception. I don't do a lot of print or pattern, especially on my top half. I love it when other people love print and they love wearing it, they look good in it. Cause I think you look good in whatever you love. I don't love a lot of print and so I don't if I make if I just make a shirt or something out of this just to use it I'm probably not gonna wear it so I'm this is like waiting for the right project if you have ideas please let me know um, yeah I, I don't know I don't know okay fabric with a story is this lace this is from my wedding dress well, this was a failed attempt at the train, actually. <laughs> and so I still have it. So when I got married, um, I wanted, I knew what dress I wanted right away. I went through a bridal magazine and there were a whole bunch of red dresses and our, our wedding colors were red, black, and leopard print. Um, and so I saw this dress and I was like, immediately, it was mermaid cut. It was, it was, it would look perfect on me. And there was a store in town that had that dress. So my mom and I went, we're going to have the experience of going shopping for the wedding dress. Um, and it was, I was super excited to try on the dress. Like no other dress piqued my interest, just this particular dress. 
So um, we go in and I can see they have the dress in the window. I'm like, that's my dress. Like, I want to try that on, please. And so the girl was like, oh, okay, let me go see. I'm not sure if we'll have it in your size, but maybe we'll have something in the same cut so you can at least make sure that the shape works for you and then we'll order you this one. Okay, cool, no problem. She comes back, she's like, yeah, okay, sorry. Like the largest size we have that dress in is an eight. At the time I was about a 14 and I'm six foot one. Yeah, I was like, okay, well that sucks. And I was like, well, do you have anything else like for me to try on that is a mermaid cut? And she's like, no, we only have two ball gowns in your size. And I said, well, I, I'm really not interested in a ball gown. Like I really do want a mermaid cut. And this is what she did. Yeah, I really don't think we're gonna have anything for you. Um, anyway, just trying to like not cry in that moment because when you're six foot one and a girl, the, the fashion world's already kind of been telling me that my body's wrong for most of my life anyway. So uh, I'm like, okay, I just, I wanna salvage this experience. Like this is probably the only time we're gonna come dress shopping. So, um, cause, cause at this point I've resolved to like find an alternate route. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'll try on. She said she had a ball gown with some red. And it was like a ball gown that had like some red flowers stitched on it. And I tried it on and, and then we left and I was like, nope, never again. And it's funny because I've been a hairdresser, I've decorated cakes and I've sewn. And I said at the beginning when we started planning our wedding, I'm like, I'm not doing my own hair. I'm not making my own cake. I'm not sewing my own dress because I just, it's a special day. I would like somebody else to worry about those things that I would normally be worrying about. I ended up doing all three, <laughs> but it, that wasn't the end of the dress saga. So I start, I had some friends that had really good luck ordering dresses on eBay. I know, I know it's not really fair to the designer, but I had like, was like, no, I am not going through the whole dress shop thing again, I'm not. So I didn't even pick the cheapest dress. I picked the one that had the best reviews. They had the dress that I wanted. They sent me a measurement sheet that was like all the measurements, like, it, and I had to take meticulous measurements. So that made me feel secure in like, okay, they're asking for all these measurements. <laughs> they're gonna use them, right? No. So I come home a few months later, and just to be clear, we are now past the point in time where I could even go to a bridal shop because that takes a better part of a year. So I show up at home and there's an 11 by 17 bubble pack envelope from China sitting on my doorstep. And I'm like, what did I order from China? I don't even, <gasps> my dress. And I look at this envelope and I'm like, there's no way. There's no way, that's not my dress. Mm -mm. It can't be. It absolutely was my dress. Crammed, it wasn't even folded nice. It was just crammed in there. And the measurements I took, I don't even, like did they lose them? I don't know. I, I wish I would have taken a picture, but I was so distraught. Like I couldn't have even laughed at it in that moment. I went to my living room, took off my clothes. My neighbor was out on her deck, so I wanted to show her. So I put the dress on and it looked like I was wearing a, a Coke can. It was just like straight, it, it was terrible. There was no crinoline. They didn't tell me <laughs> that I needed to order a crinoline separate. And if you've never ordered a wedding dress before, what do you know, right? So yeah, it was just flat. And the lace that was on the bottom where the, the dress is supposed to open up was like a Christmas tablecloth gone wrong. There was grapes. Like, it, who? Wh why would you put grapes on a wedding dress? I don't even know, like, who decided that was a good idea. But it was like this tacky, poly plastic gold and white it, it yeah it was it was bad it was so bad so i did try it on for my neighbor i walked out <laughs> she tried to hide her disappointment <laughs> i went in the house and cried i just bawled um and i took it off and i threw it in a pile on my table and i just walked away and i was like i don't even know what to do about this right now so um a few days later, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I started like looking at it and, and paying more attention to what was going on there. And the quality of the fabric was nice. The ruching along the bust was nice. The ruching in the bodice was nice too, but I ended up having to pull most of it out. And there was a beaded applique under the bust 
Um, the lace was nice and the, the beading was done nicely. So I was like, okay, there's like, there's something to work with here at least. So I grabbed my stitch ripper and the only thing that I did not have to completely pull apart was the ruching on the bust and about six inches of the applique under the bust. Everything else I completely pulled apart. And so this fabric was, I, I don't know what I was even thinking. I don't, I don't remember. I did the train and I put a seam down the middle and then I was like, that was, that's terrible. Um, yeah. So I was like, no, I need to go and buy more <laughs> lace and remake my train. Um, because there's this pretty, do I have a chunk of it? There's this pretty edge on it. So I wanted that obviously to be all around it and I did it wrong. Anyway, first time making a wedding dress. So that's why I have a schwack of this left over because this is my failed train. <laughs> but you know what, it actually worked out that I ended up making my own dress because when I went to go and find this lace, um, I also found the same, almost the exact same red fabric that my dress was made out of. It was the same fabric, but it wasn't the same dye lot. And if you held it really close together in good lighting, you could tell it wasn't the same dye lot, but from far away, you couldn't tell at all. So I ended up taking the dress that was a complete and total disaster and uh, making it into a convertible dress so that I didn't have to have my big poofy skirt on while I was dancing, which was really nice because my husband and I took tango lessons. Um, and so it was just a lot easier to dance the night away without having the big poofy skirt. So it all worked out in the end. Okay, so the next question is precious fabric and why? I don't have any. I, again, it's like the whole fabric that you don't want to cut into. It's meant to be used. Um, and yeah, I don't think, uh, other than what I've already said, like I don't think anything's really that much more special to me than anything else. Okay, the next question is dream fabric. Um, and you're probably supposed to pick like one particular fabric that you want or something, but I'm gonna do this question a little different and just say, I wish all fabric was a bit more sustainably made, that it was dyed using less chemicals, that like, I would like fabric and fashion to not be like the number two polluter on the planet. And that starts with our fabric. So that would be my dream fabric for all fabric to just be better. The next question is, where do you keep your stash? So right now that's homeschooling station and these cabinets are all my sewing stuff. This is how I store everything. I have uh, file folders that I've just cut in half. Most of them I've cut in half. I'll show you. There's an exception to that um, coming up, but I organize everything by color. It's something that I started when I was still costuming, which made sense because costuming is more about looks than the workability of the fabric. If you had to add interfacing or beat it against a rock or whatever to get it to behave, that's what you did. And so I still think of fabric like that. If I'm going to look for something, I always think of the color first. So that's how I organize my drawers. There's another one. The exception is quilting cottons I keep together because if I'm working on a quilting project, I want to see all of what I have. Um, and with quilting. Let's see if I have one here. Oh. I keep the folders. I don't, I don't cut them. I keep them whole because if I've worked on a project, then I can have all of the scraps that can still be used for other blocks all together. And so right now I have a bucket in here. This is where I'm keeping my, um, everything that's in my sewing queue is right in here. And I only have one hand, so I'll put that back together later. This is the scrap bin. Um, my oldest daughter is seven years old, so she's in here all the time, like grabbing whatever is around so that she can practice her hand stitching. And up until the other day, all four of these were completely like chock-a-block full of fabric. So I've gotten rid of like a quarter, close to half of what I had. Down here, this is like our rainy day drawer, so uh, just like kids crafts and stuff. Down there is knitting and crochet. 
Right here, this is my main sewing machine, my serger, all of my thread. It's a bit messy in here, but there you go. Uh, my tool caddy sits in here. All my rulers and everything fit in here. Then I have notions. This is reduced by about half of what it was the other day as well. This whole thing over here is mostly like bra and underwear sewing stuff and then everything else. And then books, patterns, extra file folders. Okay, so that's where I keep my stash. Okay, well, there you go. That is my hashtag show us your stash 2020 uh, video. Thank you so much, Kidnish Behavior and Pocket or Two, for putting this idea out there. I think it was a really fun one. And it was a nice way to sort of present the fun things that I rediscovered when I was cleaning out my stash. Now I still have to find somebody to take the old fabric. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. So I hope you guys had fun too, hearing my stories and seeing my fabric. And I will see you guys next time. And Sadie. Sadie, you're just, you're so excited. What are you so excited about right now? Can you believe she's 17? Oh my God. Where are my questions? Do, do, do. Uh, okay, here we go. Mm. When did that get cold? How long have I been sitting here?